Hi everyone, this is Matthew Janner for Card Runners, and I'm here with Cutoff vs. Button vs. Blind Play Part 3, where we're going to look at 3-bet pots in position. The goals for this video are going to be to go over a quick review of theory and logic, then we'll talk about 3-bet pots in position on all streets versus different types of actions. We of course can't go over every single possible action, but we'll discuss a variety of different concepts and topics regarding 3-bet pot play. So we're definitely not going to limit ourselves to just analyzing the flop. We're going to go into the turn in the river, and we'll try to note the close and key points in our range. So I'm also not going to list what I would do with every single hand in my range, because that will just take too long. But I want to point out the stuff that I think is really close or really key. Quick theory review. When we call a 3-bet, our range will be worse than the 3-betters. We called because we got a good price preflop usually around two to one and have the advantage of position. At least in this example, we have the advantage of position. So we're assuming the three bet came from the small blind or the big blind. We called with many hands preflop expecting to overall lose money for the hand, just less than we would have if we immediately folded to the three bet. Because of this, we don't have to defend enough to prevent the three better from profitably betting any two cards on some board textures. So this is very similar to a spot where the button opens and the big blind calls and in that spot which happens all the time you're probably very used to the big blind almost always checking if not literally always checking then the button betting at a pretty high frequency and the big blind folding often enough that the button can profitably bet any two cards that makes sense there because the button opens gives the big blind a really really cheap price so the big blind calls with a weak range which results in him check folding a lot it's going to be a similar thing here where even though we have the advantage of position here, if the small blind three bets and we call in the cutoff, for example, his range is going to be quite a lot better than ours. So because of that, there's nothing necessarily wrong if the small blind can profitably bet any two cards in some situations. There's already a lot of money in the pot, and we have the weaker range, so it makes sense that we might fold often enough that our opponent can profitably bet any two cards, but we're still going to defend reasonably aggressively. So now there's some other stuff we should mention because you're not a robot. So if our opponent bets 60% of the pot on the flop, we're getting slightly worse than 3 to 1 odds. So everyone pretty much knows that, I think, but 60% is a little bit over half the pot, so we're not getting quite 3 to 1 odds, but slightly worse. We are very, very regularly calling on the flop despite not being happy with our position because we're getting such a good price. Keep in mind, our really good hands got 4-bet preflop, so... It's hard for us to be like really happy on the flop unless we flopped a monster because the hands that we could have had that are like, you know, the really, really strong hands, they're not in our three bet calling range. Yeah, we slow bet, slow play aces, but for the most part, like our ace king, our kings, our queens, that stuff all got four bet preflop. So our calling range just isn't that strong. We're not usually very happy with where we're at. Also, keep in mind, our opponent's checking range is weaker than his betting range. So we usually dislike seeing a bet. So in general... You know, sometimes you're going to have a really, really strong hand and want to face a bet. But for the most part, if your opponent's putting more money in the pot, that's not usually a good thing. Because that means he thinks he has a profitable hand where he can put money in the pot. You'd much rather see him check and represent the weaker range. So, most people, myself included, find it hard getting yourself to do something that will likely have a bad outcome, but is overall a good life decision. So, even if we're not thinking poker, an example would be is... I would hate having to spend five hours applying for a job that I think I have a 3% chance of getting. So yeah, just think of a non-poker example real quickly. Even if you know it's a really good decision to apply for a job you're unlikely to get, it sucks to have to spend five hours and basically waste a Saturday afternoon applying for a job when you know the outcome is going to likely be bad. So you might force yourself to do it because you know it's a really good life decision, but at the end of the day, it sucks to do something knowing you're probably going to get a bad outcome. Very few people want to do something where they know they're probably going to get a bad outcome. But that leak is absolutely devastating in poker. You have to take high variance but plus EV lines, so you have to make the right decision even though the outcome is probably going to be bad. And we're going to be doing that nonstop in this video. We're going to be calling with hands where, honestly, we're probably going to end up losing more money because we called. But since we are getting such a good price and since the good outcome is disproportionately good compared to the bad outcome, because we are getting that good price, we're going to end up calling. So, yeah, good outcome is better than the bad outcome in magnitude, so we call. All right, our thought process for flops turns rivers. So the first question I'm going to ask myself is, how good was this flop turn 
or river for our range relative to our opponent's range. And you're going to see me do the same thing that I did in the last video, which is just kind of guess how the equities change. The second question I'm going to ask myself is, what is the weakest hand that actually wants to face a bet? So again, I'm trying to make sure we get into that mental state where we understand we don't usually want to face bets, but that doesn't mean we're going to fold because calling will still be profitable. And then the last question I'm going to ask is, what is the weakest hand that will call or raise against a bet? So my goal here is really just to show, even if we don't have many hands in our range that want to face a bet, especially if our opponent's betting range is pretty polarized, you know, we're not usually going to want to face a bet with many hands in our range. But that said, even though we don't have many hands that want to face a bet, we're usually going to be defending pretty aggressively. So we're usually going to be calling or raising with some hands that are still pretty weak because calling or raising is more profitable than folding, even though we wish our opponent would have just checked. So now I have put the cutoff three bet calling range into Equilab. It's the range on the top. I did go ahead and include all the ace 10 off and king jack off combos just to make it a little bit easier. But as I mentioned before, those might be a mixed strat where you fold them sometimes, three bet them, or sorry, you fold them sometimes, maybe call three bet sometimes, and maybe you even four bet sometimes. And then I also put the small blind three betting range right here at the bottom, which we can look at really quickly again. And remember, the small blind three betting range is a pretty wide range. We're three betting the small blind 15% of the time. And as we can see, if the cutoff calling range includes all ace 10 off and king jack off, it has 47% equity against the small blind's 53% equity. All right, so let's get down to business and start randomly generating them. The first one is boom, queen 10, eight two tone. All right, so now pause for a moment and I want you to guess the equity. I'm gonna guess the equity myself and maybe be very off here, but guess how much equity each range has on this queen of clubs, eight of clubs, 10 of diamonds flop. All right, so hopefully you've paused it already and I'm gonna think a little bit. So I think this board is gonna favor the cutoff three bet calling range quite a bit because the cutoff three bet calling range has all the like ace queen off, queen king off stuff. And then when there's two high cards, like the 10 also would favor the cutoff cold client range, I think, pretty well because it gives us ace 10 off. Although we don't have king 10 off. And we don't have jack 9 off. But I think overall this range is still going to do... I, overall, I think this this flop's going to hit the cutoff cold client range a little bit better than most flops do because there are two high cards. And even the 8's not that low. It, it'll give us some pairs and some gutters and stuff. And yeah, we're, and we're also in position, so position is pretty nice, but that won't be reflected in the equity. So I'm going to guess that the cutoff cold climb range has like 48.7% equity. I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm that precise. I'm just going to going to go all the way guessing. Oh, so even more than that. So 50.9%. Okay, so this board really favors the cutoff cold calling range. And by the way, whenever I say the cutoff cold calling range, I just mean the cutoff three bet calling range. I actually really dislike the term cold call, but I seem to be using it by accident because it's just easier to say. So just know whenever I say cold calling range, I mean the three bet calling range. All right, so here is the three bet calling range. And we already did the equity thing. So now the next thing I want to answer is, what is the worst hand I will defend here to a flop C bet? So I'm going to make a guess before we like look into this range in detail. And my guess off the top of my head would be something like, Ace, nine of diamonds. I think I would still defend, and that's probably the weakest hand I'd defend. So we're never going to know for sure if that's right, but that's that's what I would defend if I were actually playing ace, nine of diamonds or better. All right, so now let's let's actually get rid of this cumulative for a minute while we make that guess. Just looking at all our hands real quick. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with ace, nine of diamonds. I think I'm going to defend every single pair that's not pocket sevens because nines have the gutter, so I'm going to defend that. And then all the other pairs are pretty much going to either, most are going to be combo draws or be like top pair with a good kicker. So yeah, ace nine of diamonds, final answer is the weakest hand I think I defend here. So now let's bring out this um, cumulative distribution. So cutoff has weak pair or better 76.6% of the time or 87 and a half combos. And the only pair we're folding, sorry, the only pair or better we're folding, I think is pocket sevens. I can't see anything else I'd fold. So that means we are defending 81.5 combos out of 129.5 that are a pair or better. So let's put that in a calculator. 81.5 divided by 129.5. 
So that already means we're defending 63% of our range just from defending our pairs, or better. Now let's look at what else we're defending. We're going to be defending our flush draws, but some of these are going to be pairs. So how do we... No, it doesn't do that. Okay. So we have to just manually count them. So that's going to be ace-jack, ace-nine, king-jack, king-nine, seven-six, and ace-five. So that's going to be six combos that are flush draws that we defend. So that means we're defending... 67.6% of our range is going to be the pairs or better or flush draws because we've had six flush draws that aren't pairs and then we had six pairs we're folding the pocket sevens. So that gives us a 67.6% that we can see in Flopzilla. And I'm trying to think if we defend anything else that's not a pair or a flush draw. Oh, gosh, we still have King Jack and Ace Jack. Wow. Um... Yeah, we're defending a lot on this board. So that would mean we're going to be defending like another... Well, the ace-jack is going to make another 15 combos. The king-jack would make, depending on how many combos we're using, like maybe another 10. So if we defend those, that would be like... Tw let's just say that's 20 more combos. So that'd be 107.5 divided... 107.5 divided by 129.5. So that's 83% of our range here. Wow. Now, th this doesn't mean the opponent won't have a betting range. This just means we're defending a very large fraction of our range. So maybe we're defending too wide because I would also have defended like ace-9 suited, as I mentioned. So maybe with ace-9 suited, we'd be defending a little bit too wide. But it really should drive the point home for just how bad recklessly continuation betting is for the opponent on this queen-10-8 board. I would have thought C betting with a really bad hand would have been bad for the small blind, but now I just realize like the magnitude of how bad it likely is. Because I think all the hands we listed, most people would not fold. I can't imagine someone's going to really fold ace jack on this flop. There's no way they fold king jack. So recklessly C betting from the small blind shoes is going to be really bad. So the small blind should like go out of his way, you know, check reasonably often, and then defend some of his checks by check raising and check calling. Because we have a really strong range here. We're in position. We're going to bet reasonably often once our opponent checks. And when he does bet, we're going to defend really aggressively. So another thing to consider on this board is it really sucks for us to call on this flop and let our opponent see the turn relatively cheaply. So I'm going to do another guessing thing right now. Because I like guessing when I'm analyzing stuff because it shows me how far off I am. So I learn from my mistakes quicker if, I'm, if I remember being wrong. So now I want to guess like, okay... You should guess, too. How often do you think ace-queen is beat on this flop if we have ace-queen? So, um, and we're in the cutoff. So if we flop ace, you know, if we flop this flop and we have ace-queen, how often are we beat? And this is not something I've thought about much, but my guess is going to be we're beat like... Oh, I should mention splitting, too. My guess is we're going to be, like, beat or splitting, like, 19% of the time. But I could be way off there. But let's look. How often does small line have ace-queen beating or split. So let's say we have ace queen, top pair. So we want to add, we're going to look at his over pair better and we're going to add how many combos of ace queen can our opponent have if we have ace queen and there's a queen on the board. So you should know this. The answer is six. There's three. If we have ace queen and this is the flop, there's three aces left in the deck and two queens left in the deck. So three times two is going to be six. There's six combos of ace queen in the opponent's range. So if there's six Ace queen in the opponent's range. We're going to add these six combos to the 21 that are over pair better. So it's going to be 27 divided by 138. 27 divided by 138. So we're beat 19 and a half percent of the time. Okay. So you're not going to get a clear answer here. But if an opponent's recklessly C betting here, like raising ace queen might actually be good because even though we don't really want action when we raise ace queen, we really don't want to give a lot of free cards here. But if the opponent's not recklessly C betting, and he's you know C betting a more polarized range, and maybe he's check calling with like a lot of the hands Ace Queen does really well against, like maybe he check calls on the flop with Queen Jack and King Queen, like I, I think he should. If that's the case, then raising Ace Queen's probably not going to be as effective. So I don't think we're going to want to raise Ace Queen in the cutoff, though it's something I would at least consider now after having looked at this board. Meaning, if I was in the cutoff in the small blind C bet, and I have a, a HUD, I would pull up his stats, and if he C bets recklessly. And three bets from the small line really aggressively, I would pretty much consider a raise. Because our ace queen's strong, but it's also really vulnerable. Okay, so anyways, let's go back to the cutoff calling range. Where are you? 
right here. So the hands I'm going to raise here are probably just going to be anything really that strong. I don't think I'm going to slow play on this board. So the, something that I talk about pretty often with, with people that I discuss poker with is I think optimal poker has a very come at me bro attitude in a lot of spots. So like right here, for example, on this flop, I don't think I'd slow play anything strong. But by the same token, our range isn't really going to be capped all that often on the turn. And even if our range is capped at like ace queen on a like a three of spades turn, which is what it would be capped at, like in you know, we I don't think we would have anything better than ace queen, but maybe I'm missing one hand. But if our range is capped at let's say ace queen on a on a three turn, eh, ace queen's still pretty good. Like I mean, I'm not happy about my overall range on the three of spades turn after I called our uh, my opponent's flop bet. But we got a really good price. We didn't know the turn was going to be a total blank. We probably called with a lot of hands that could improve. That didn't. And ace-queen still pretty good. So, yeah, I would call with... I would call on the flop, I think, with ace-queen in weaker hands. Whereas I would raise the hands that are better than ace-queen and then some bluffs. So let's let's get into that right now. Right now. All right. So what's better than ace-queen? Let's overpair better. All these hands. Yeah, I'm going to raise... Pretty much all those. I don't think I slow play any of them. I think they're all too vulnerable. If you want to slow play aces with a club, more power to you. I don't really care. But I think I would go ahead and raise all of the highlighted hands, which is 20 combos. And then to balance that, I always forget this, but off the top of my head, I think we need... We definitely need a lot less bluffs since it's a 3-bet pot. But I think it's something like 60% value to 40% bluff, although... You know, the term value bet and bluff don't work perfectly anyways. So if we're raising like 20 combos for value here, I'd probably look to raise like, I don't know, maybe 13 or 14, maybe like 12 or 13 bluffs in a couple draws. Something like that uh, seems fair enough. And it's, of course, going to depend on sizing and everything too. But I do believe I'm remembering it correctly, and it's somewhere around there. So yeah, let's say we raise these, and let's say we want to raise, you know, like 13 bluffs. So let's try to find those 13 bluffs or 12 bluffs or, or something like that. And it, all right, so I think like the ace nine of diamonds, I think that's something that can raise pretty well. And then another thing too, and I actually have to kind of give credit to Poker Snowy for this. Poker Snowy likes to sort of, if you want to call it a bluff raise, it, it would probably be reasonable. But Poker Snowy likes to bluff raise with some kind of high equity hands. So for example, I wouldn't be surprised if Poker Snowy wants to raise like nine eight suited here. Like, and when I say nine eight suited, it can be the nine eight of diamonds or the spades or the hearts. So. 8-9 suited might be a profitable call, but it might also be kind of nice to raise that hand because we can check back on a 9 turn because now we have, you know, the weakest two pair, but they might be good. Our opponent could easily have aces, kings, or ace, queen, and we're ahead. So we can check back if we turn a 9. We can keep value betting, or we can start value betting if we turn an 8 or a... Um, a jack, I guess, is a little bit thinner, but I, I think we can still go ahead and keep value betting if we turn a jack. Our opponent might have some ace-kings, but whatever. So yeah, we can value bet if we turn a jack or an eight. We can check back if we turn a nine. And even though eight and nine pseudo might be a profitable flop call, it has a reasonable amount of equity on the flop. So if we, you know, when a hand has a reasonable amount of equity and its equity is pretty robust, it might be worthwhile putting it in the raising range because we want to take some sort of high equity hands with, you know, some hands that have a good amount of equity and the equity is robust and put them in the range where more money goes into the pot. So let me try to be a little bit clearer about that because I don't think I explained it particularly well. The older way of thinking, I think, is to kind of raise your best hands for value, call your next best hands, bluff your hands not strong enough to call, and then fold your worst hands. And we've already seen that doesn't work very well pre-flop. Like, I used to design ranges like that four years ago, and ranges now are just much, much better. Post-flop in a spot like that, it's gonna we're going to play closer to that. We're going to play closer to raising our best hands, calling our next best, bluffing our next, be next best, folding our worst. But sometimes it might be good to take a hand that would still make a pretty good call and move it to the raising range, even though you'd probably consider it a bluff raise. We're going to try to either, you know, get lucky and outdraw our opponent or make them fold a better hand. And I just think a hand like you know, 9-8, because it does have a reasonable amount of robust equity and might play reasonably well as a raise. Whereas a hand like ace-jack, you know, ace-jack might be a little bit better to call with because, you know, if we call with ace-jack, maybe our opponent's barreling on the flop with king-jack. And then if we have ace-jack and our opponent has king-jack, we're going to be doing very, very well. Um, his jack is tainted. If he makes the king, we make the straight. And then if, you know, the turn card comes to 9, it's going to be pretty obvious. Um, you know, ace-jack's not very good once the turn comes to 9. And if the turn card comes... An ace will probably lose some value, but not a tremendous amount.
And, we, you know, we might still float. So I, I want to be clear. We might still call on a nine turn because we'll have four to the straight and we'll be drawing to the nuts at the River Kings. But we likely are just going to fold, I think, if the turn card comes to nine and our opponent barrels. And if he does barrel, we're not usually going to end up losing a huge pot with ace high. Okay. So what other hands make good bluff raises? I think king nine suited would be one. And then I'm already starting to struggle a little bit. Okay, so I'm already struggling. So I think there are a lot of hands that make good value raises here. I I mean, those were easy to find, right? It was just pretty much this stuff. But I'm having a hard trouble, time finding hands that make good bluff raises. And we can definitely raise some draws. But if I'm noticing this as I'm analyzing ranges, I'm immediately going to take a mental note and be like, Okay, notice on this board, a lot of hands make good value raises, but very few hands make good bluff raises. From my experience talking with just various players, especially if they're like smaller stakes players, there's still a tendency to do the whole raise your best hands for value, call your next best, bluff your next best, fold your worst. There's that tendency that is still there because that's, I think, how people used to play a little bit more like a couple years ago, and also because that strategy just works kind of well. Like in a lot of spots, like if the cutoff opens and we're on the button preflop, raising our best hands for value, calling our next best, and three bet bluffing the hands not quite good enough to call actually works really well. So there are a lot of spots where, you know, doing that whole, I'm going to say it one more time, sorry, raise your best, call your next best, bluff raise your next best, fold your worst, that strategy still works pretty well. But because that strategy works pretty well, and because I think more people used to apply that strategy a couple years ago, I think you see people still over applying that now. Whereas it's harder to get yourself to like bluff raise with a hand that would still make a pretty good call. So now on this flop, I've noticed I would not be bluff raising enough here if I was playing. Like I'm not going to have this range in front of me if I'm playing. I'm just going to straight up make a mistake. So I probably should think here like, okay, my range is crazy strong here in the cutoff after I call a three bet. The small blind really shouldn't be c-betting that recklessly if he's good. So maybe a hand like ace-jack that I thought was a call, maybe I should be bluff raising that. Like maybe ace-jack off with, let's say, the ace of clubs, maybe that makes a good bluff raise because if I call, if I raise and my opponent calls, I can ship the turn really comfortably. If I raise and I get my opponent to fold, I probably made him fold the better hand. And I almost certainly made him fold the better hand, really. And if I raise in my opponent three bets all in, it's not really devastating to have to fold that hand. So yeah, we can do a mixture of raising like some of our draws and calling some of our draws. And by draws, I mean like an open and a straight draw or a flush draw, a draw with eight or more outs. But I think with a hand like ace-jack, I probably would have called with them all here. But seeing how aggressively I want to be raising for value, I probably should you know, be raising my ace-jack off. Even with or without a club, I probably should be raising some. And so yeah, let's say I raise ace-jack off with the ace of clubs, ace-jack with a diamond, ace-jack, and then maybe a couple of the ace-jack with no ace of clubs I raise, whereas others I call. I should be maybe playing more of a mixed strategy there, so I am not just super weighted towards value raises when I raise. And then for all the other hands I'd mentioned I'd defend with, I probably still would defend with them, and I would just realize when we call with a lot of these hands, they're only probably very slightly profitable calls, but we're calling because we're getting a good price and our hand has um, you know a reasonable amount of equity. The weakest hand I think I called with was like, Ace Jack off because I raised the Ace Nine of Nine, so Ace Jack off is probably the weakest hand we called with. We're drawing to the nuts. We're drawing, you know, an Ace is going to be good a lot of the time too. So, yeah, I think that's how I would defend this range here in position. The other thing I would just make sure I really took from this is honestly, if I had to guess what these ranges we're using, the small blinds C bet frequency on this board should probably be low. So let's go back and look at this that range again. I mean, it's fine for the small blind to three bet here some of the time. If he literally always checks, I think his checking range would get too strong and we could exploit that in position. But I think the small blind should not have a very high C betting frequency. So if, you know, if somehow I magically knew that in theory, the small blind should only be C betting on this flop like 25% of the time or 20% of the time, that would not surprise me because this is a board that the player in position has more equity. Um, both this range has 16.1% over pair or better. The cutoff call has 16.7% over, well, that's the wrong range, um, has 15.4% over pair or better. So very similar there. Um, so yeah, they have a similar amount of equity, a similar amount of really, really good hands. And then the button just has position and position is really, really good here. Okay. So that was a lot of talking. Now let's quickly discuss what we do here in position. If our opponent checked on the flop, and I don't think this is a spot most people will struggle with. I think most people are pretty comfortable with 
playing against checks. You just kind of bet the good stuff, bet some bluffs, and then check back the middle stuff. So, yeah, just I would do that, and I would start my value betting range at probably like king, queen, or better. Even king, queen might be a check on the flop, but honestly, I'd probably just bet it. I, I think people don't check raise as aggressively as they maybe should on this board in general from what I've seen and what I can remember. Again, I'm not actively playing, so maybe the games have changed, but I think you can still comfortably bet it like with king, queen here if you're playing small stakes or lower. Um, I would definitely bet like all the really good stuff. You don't have anything here that's really strong enough to slow play, I don't think. And slow playing on a board like this isn't really that good unless you think you're going to face over bets. And again, that's something that I just haven't heard of people doing much. So let's say we have jack nine of clubs on this flop for like the super nuts. I still wouldn't slow play it because I do talk a good amount of poker and people just aren't showing me hands where they check back on a flop like this and then they face an over bet on the turn in river. So if people were doing that, then yeah, we maybe should check back jack nine of clubs. But since most people probably aren't. Most people you're playing against, if you're watching this video, probably aren't. I would definitely not slow play that. So yeah, bet the good stuff, check the middle stuff. And then for the bluffs, I want to just point out, I would not bluff a hand like seven, six of spades here. I think that's like one of the weakest hands we can have in our range, or actually let's get crazy with it. Like ace, five of spades is probably like the weakest hand we can have. I would not bluff with this hand. I don't think it has enough equity. Its equity is not robust enough. So when I say I wouldn't bluff with ace five of spades, I mean I wouldn't bluff with it on the flop. I would rather bluff with the hands that have a little bit more equity and a little bit more robust equity, whereas a hand that's like as crappy as ace five of spades or seven six of spades, I would just say, hey, let's check this back, and then if we want, we can bluff it later. But let's, you know, let's put the better bluffs in our flop betting range because we're building the pot when we bluff on the flop. So let's put our good bluffs in that range. Some of the hands that you know can get lucky, whereas if our opponents, um. You know, if we check and not, if our opponents check and we check back, we're still going to need a probably, like, let's say the turn's a four. We're still going to need some hands that can bluff here if our opponent checks us on the turn. So then when we're value betting our, like, queen jack, maybe king queen if we have it, maybe we'll even start value betting some pocket jacks if we have them, although I know they're not in this range right now. But if we had pocket jacks, we might start betting them on the turn. Then we can bluff with, like, the ace five of spades. Or if we wanted, if we had the ace five of spades on the four of heart turn, we could even save the bluff to the river. We could even check back twice with the ace five of spades, not because we plan on showing down with it, but because we want some hands to bluff with on the river, and maybe we want to bluff the really crappy hand on the river. So that's a whole other long discussion, but I just really want to point out, I think neither the out of position or in position player should be bluffing on the flop with the really crappy hands. All right, so let's randomly generate the turn. We've been talking about the flop a lot. So if let's we'll talk about the turn based on a few different lines that could have happened on the flop. So let's randomly generate it. And let's talk about what we would do if our opponent bet the flop and we called first, because I think that's going to happen a lot more often in practice than it should in theory. Okay. So if we call a flop bet, I'm just going to unclick this for one sec. If we call a flop bet, we're definitely, we definitely know our range is going to be pretty much capped on the turn. And our opponent should have a sense of that too, because we wouldn't really slow play a strong hand on a board this way. So we're kind of taking that come at me, bro attitude where, yeah, the turn's going to often improve a lot of hands in our range, but even if it doesn't, we're still going to have some ace queens and stuff. And we're just going to end up having to be unhappy and calling sometimes on this turn card, you know, some flushes got there. So it's probably not going to be particularly tough to play this turn card, I don't think I talked about what I would do at 8-7 on the flop, but that might be a call. That might be a raise. That could even be a fold. So maybe we'll have some 8-7 in our range. It's not an awesome hand, so that's going to be called with anyways. I'm um, sorry. If we have it on the turn, it's going to be called with anyways. I'm trying to think of anything else kind of got there other than the flushes. And the flushes is a huge deal. But yeah, Jack-9 was already straight, so it didn't. Okay, cool. So mainly just some flushes got there. Okay, so if we face a turn bet here, sort of like I would kind of imagine the situation like this a little bit. When the button opens, and people like to min-raise on the button, even though I particularly don't, if the button min-raises and you call on the big blind, you know ranges are very asymmetrical on the flop, and you're going to be check-folding a lot because you're out of position and your opponent's range is a lot better than yours. I would take a kind of similar attitude to once you've called a C-bet on this flop. Now, that doesn't mean I think you're going to fold like crazy on the turn, but I mean, I would at least have the attitude which was like, you know what, I called a lot of hands on the flop because I was getting a really good price, so... My opponent's range is going to be better than me on the turn. So it might not be a problem if I let my opponent C-bet any two cards profitably on the turn because he wasn't able to do that on the flop. I defended like crazy on the flop. So even if my opponent can get in a profitable turn spot, 
you know, his, his, even if his turn bet is profitable, he had to pay money to get into that situation. And if we raise him reasonably aggressively on the flop, then he doesn't even always get to the option of bluffing the turn. Because a lot of times he would have been, you know, see bet bluffing on the flop. We raise him on the flop and he just has to mock. All right. So yeah, our range is going to be weaker than our opponents on the turn. We get this turn card though, and some of our hands get there. So what's the weakest hand I would defend with here? I mean, it's going to be probably some sort of draw. So let's think. I'm trying to think the weak, the weakest draw I can have. So the weakest draw I can have is probably going to be like King Jack with a club. Or no, that's not the weakest draw we can have. Let me think. It's going to be like King Jack without a club. So King Jack without a club, I think, folds here on the turn. I'm not going to count out all the combos, but remember our flop. See, betting our flop continuing range was really, really wide. We were defending like over 80% of the time, though not always by calling. And King Jack wasn't like a phenomenal hand. And then on the turn, you know, this turn card kind of sucks for King Jack. So King Jack without a club, I think I'm, I'm going to say I'm definitely folding right now, though, of course I could be wrong. And then Ace Jack also without a club, which we may or may not have any. I'm mucking all of those. So Ace Jack and King Jack without a club, I think get mucked reasonably quickly. Then what else? We were also calling on the flop with hands like 10 Jack, um, Ace 10, and then King 10 suited. So I probably too would fold most of those that don't have a club. And then I would mostly defend with, like, let's think. Nines with nines with a club I would defend. I think nines without a club I would not. Jack 10, I'm folding. 10 9, I think I'm calling. Though that might be bad, but I think I would. And then... What else? I'm trying to just think. Sorry, I know it sucks when you're when I'm just like saying uh in the mic as I'm thinking, but unfortunately I gotta do it. Yeah, so muck the King Jacks, mucks the Ace Jacks, muck some of the like I think the Jack ten gets mucked, the King Ten gets mucked, and the Ace Ten even gets mucked. And again, if I'm folding like enough that my opponent can profitably see bet any two cards on this turn, I'm not having a big problem with it. And then on the turn, I think a lot of our flushes are gonna be like the nut flush. And so we could raise some of those, and we can maybe ship some, like, semi-bluffs, too. So if we did call on the flop with, um, you know, the, the King Jacks and the Ace Jacks, maybe we call with some of them on the turn, and we ship some on the turn. All right, so, yeah, mostly muck the middle pair stuff. And then the draws that are, that didn't improve. If our opponent bet on the flop and checked to us on this seven-club turn, I'm actually probably, I don't think I'm going to bet crazy aggressively on that turn. I think we're definitely going to obviously bet our flushes. And then I think you're going to want to bet your ace queens with or without the clubs because they're strong and vulnerable. And I think you, in practice, I think I would ch I would check the king queens and I think I would bet that, the ace queens. I also think on this turn, you're probably not going to get check raised in practice all that often because people in general, I don't think like to check raise as aggressively when they can check raise like right into the nuts. So here... Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't say that for sure. I, I don't know. And it's going to depend on what limit you're playing. But I would bet ace-queen, and I would not expect to get check-raised all that often. I think what's going to be more common is someone c-bets on the flop with a hand they shouldn't c-bet with. And then when you call, they end up holding, like, king-queen on the turn, and then they go, uh, and then they check-call it. So I would definitely bet ace-queen if my opponent checks to me. But again, your, your mileage may vary based on what limit you play. So yeah, ace, queen, better, I'm betting on the turn. Pretty much everything in the middle I'm checking. And then for the bluffs, you're just going to have your, like, king, jack, and ace, jack, that bluff. You also probably have some nines. You might have a couple nine stuff. Like, eight, nine, I would just go ahead and bluff with it if we didn't raise it on the flop. Ten, nine, two, I would probably turn it into a bluff just because I think it has enough equity that I'd rather put it in the betting range as a, you know, as a semi-bluff than I would rather check back with it. So yeah, um, I think it's pretty easy, again, just to play against checks. So... Another interesting line that could happen is your opponent checks flop, you check flop back, and then he bets. What's cool here to notice is that line is actually pretty easy to defend against unless your opponent starts overbetting. And it might actually make sense for him to overbet here because if you're going to c-bet all of your flush draws on the flop, whereas if your opponent was c-betting at a very low frequency, that means your opponent can have flushes on the turn, but you can't. And likewise, your opponent might have been trying to check raise on the flop with like jack nine, pocket tens, pocket eights, whatever. So he could have pocket tens or pocket eights in his range on the turn if it went check, check on the flop, but you can't because you would not have checked back in position with any of the nutted hands. So this is a spot where, especially exploitatively, but I think even in theory, an overbet can make a lot of sense. And it's something you want to consider doing if you're the out of position player. So let's get rid of the turn card for a second and imagine you were in the small blind. 
if you were you know checking a lot on this flop texture as I talked about, and then the turn card came to seven of clubs, I think you can definitely look at your opponent's stats and see if you think he makes a really good overbet bluff target. Because he might just have stats where he'll just fold way, way too much. And I would challenge you as you're watching this video to imagine you checked uh, you imagine you checked back this flop and this card came to turn. How often would you really defend if your opponent overbet? I mean, you're probably going to defend with your hands that are like, you know, the some sort of ace or king flush draw with either then a draw or a pair, which there might not be even that many of those. So, like, you're going to defend with, like, king, queen off with the king of clubs, but you're not going to have that many combos with that. Um, ace, jack, you probably actually bet on the flop anyways, so I shouldn't even say that. So, I think on this flop, if or sorry, on this turn, if my opponent overbet and I was in the cutoff, I would just fold like crazy. And I would expect most players to fold like crazy too. And again, when I say most players, I'm assuming most people watching this are playing like small stakes. I would expect you to just get a ton of folds from the small blind shoes if you overbet this turn because it's just really hard for the cutoff to be strong after he checked back. And that doesn't mean the cutoff did anything wrong. It just means the cutoff checked back with a range that just does kind of poorly on club turns. And then the one in five shot hit where he got a club turn. All right, so if he bets, if the uh, if the small blind bets small in the turn, though, it's pretty easy. You just call with all the medium strength stuff. You're pretty much going to have no raising range, and then just fold all the weaker stuff. Okay, so we're done with the turn. I'm going to randomly generate the river now. Why did that not work? Okay, we got to re-random it. Sorry, I didn't I didn't lock the turn. All right, now everything's secure. Time to re-randomly generate it. All right, the six. Okay, river six. So if I'm playing and I'm in the cutoff shoes and I'm facing a bunch of barrels on this board, I'm pretty much going to be lost. Like realistically, I'm not going to know my range enough. I would have been playing multiple tables. I'm going to be confused what the small blind's betting with on the flop, what he's betting with on the turn. And then if he just barrels away and the river card comes a nine, I'm just going to be like, okay, I'm pretty much lost here. And then I'm going to just kind of freeze up and call with the better hands in my range. But that's probably reasonably close to what's theoretically correct too, right? You just call with the better hands. So here on the river, we just are kind of guessing our range on the river. That was a bad sentence. But we're, we're kind of guessing what our range looks like and calling with just like the hands that seem good enough. So I think on the river, I would probably find the hero call against someone good with like ace queens, fold the queen kings, and then... If I, ha if I can have any nines, I would obviously call with those. I guess I said I could have nines with the club, so yeah, snap that off. If I slow played any flushes, call with that. But on the river, my range is pretty much, my calling range is basically going to be ace, queen, or better. Um, a question I don't know the answer to right here is whether or not calling with the ace of clubs helps us. So for example, like let's say we have ace, queen with the ace of clubs. I think most people would think, oh, call with the ace, queen with the ace of clubs because you block the nut flushes in the opponent's range. And that's true. But we also block our opponent if he was, like, going to bluff all three streets with, like, ace-jack off with the ace of clubs. So we're not just blocking the nut flushes. We're blocking the nut flush semi-bluff, which might keep bluffing on the river. That makes it tricky. Like, I, I don't know the answer to that, whether or not having um the ace blocker is the ace of clubs blocker is good. And that's just, I mean, that's just a question that I expect people that are, like, a lot better than me to know. But it's not something that's detailed enough for me to, like care a tremendous amount about, but if you are that good, then that actually could maybe matter a lot, because I wouldn't be surprised if whether or not you have the ace of club blocker makes calling all, you know significantly better, significantly worse. I just don't know it off the top of my head. So yeah, on this river, I think in reality, you're going to always look at stats if you have a HUD, and I think if it was a completely HUDless site, I would probably just fold too much on the river, but my guess is what's like theoretically correct is just going to be to call with your better stuff, and that's probably going to mean you're going to call like ace-queen and better, and I think you're going to fold like king-queen. I think you're going to fold um, – you're going to fold like any of the draws that just have whiffed, and I think you're going to even fold like – yeah, I think king-queen will be the best hand you fold – and even then, in theory, it wouldn't blow my mind if, like, that needs to be called. Because if we're folding enough, like, let me think what we'd be folding. We'd be folding some, some A-Shack and some King-Jack, the ones that had the clubs. And we'd be folding, oh, not, I guess not all that much. Yeah, so I would just, I, I would, I, if I had to guess right now, calling, in theory, is maybe, like, Ace-Queen and better. But really, just a guess. So yeah, we could write out all the combos here, but again, this isn't something I want to do for this specific video. I want it to be more like, what would we do if we're playing? Likewise, if we want to think about what we do from the small blinds perspective, I think 
this is a reasonable river card to bluff on because I don't think people are going to slow play all that often on the turn or the flop. So that means it's kind of hard for the cutoff to be nutted. And I think our opponent's going to have a lot of queen, king, and ace, queen on the river. So it really just becomes one of those, do you think the opponent will muck ace, uh, ace, queen, and queen, king when they face a river shove? And I think the answer to that, again, for most small stakes players would be yes. I think most people will find the fold with ace, queen, or queen, king. Um, but yeah, you're really going to want to use a HUD here. But I think it's a it's a pretty good spot to bluff if you're this um, if you're in the small blind, and it might even be profitable to bluff any two cards profitably, to be honest. And we've talked about how that can make sense once ranges are asymmetrical. So yeah, you can definitely tell just from me talking. I'll go ahead and own it. My river advice is probably the worst here because I'm just not super comfortable in this spot. But I do think it's a good spot for the small blind to bluff. I think it might be theoretically correct if the small blind can profitably bluff any two cards. Because he might just not have that many pure air hands on the river to begin with. And then I think if we are in the cutoff, our range is going to be still be weaker than our opponents on the river, I think. And, it, you know, it's okay if we fold enough that he can properly bet any two cards, I think. But again, this is mostly guessing if I wanted to give... Um, if I wanted to have a stronger opinion, I have to write out all the combos, and we're not doing that in this vid. And another cool thing to just keep in mind is, like, if you checked all... Th if you checked the flop in the turn with the ace, five of spades, and it's been checking down, now would be kind of like when I bluff with it. <laughs> where it's just, like, it's not even really ace high. It's it's like ace high with if the opponent has no kicker. So, um, you know, you, you can check back multiple streets with, I think, a hand that has almost no equity. And then on the river, if it just keeps checking down, now you go, okay, now I want to bet ace five suited to balance out my bluffs with, um, you know, whatever you're value betting with on the river. Maybe it's pocket sevens, maybe it's pocket nines, whatever. But I do want to stress, and it might be the most important thing you take from this video if you don't know it, going all the way back to the flop. When I say I would check back ace five of spades, I don't, it's EV is not zero. And I'm not saying don't bluff it or just, you know, give up. You're, you're done. The board hits too many hands. I'm saying we're going to start with checking. And then if, you know, it keeps getting checked, we're going to give it a little bluff ruski We're not giving up with it yet. We just don't think the flop is the best spot to bluff, or at least I don't. I would delay the bluff till later. So that board took a little bit longer than I thought. We've only done one hand, so I'll stick with the small blind three betting range and try to go a little bit faster, but let's randomly generate one more. All right, so nine, nine, eight. So ask yourself how the equity is going to change. See if you can guess correctly. Hmm. This one, I, I don't want to, I don't want to cheat. I don't want to look at the range, but um, this one I'm going to guess is going to be, let's get that range out of there. This, this one I'm going to guess is going to favor the small blind three betting range because I think the small blind still three bet a, a reasonable amount of chip, trips here, right? The small blind is still three betting like 10, nine, jack, nine, queen, nine, king, nine. Whereas if we would have made the board like eight, eight, seven, it would miss the three betting range a little bit more. Whereas the cold calling range, I don't, ah, I did it again, cold call. The three bet calling range, I don't think has that many, it doesn't have like off suit nines, right? Like it has off suit tens and ace, 10 off. And it has tons of off suit jacks, queens, and kings, but no off suit nines, I don't think. So because of that, I don't think it's going to have that many combos of trips. I think the small blind will probably have a little bit more trips than the cutoff. And then the small blind has all the over pairs and like a lot of really good semi-bluffing hands like ace-king and just jack-10. So I think this is going to favor the three betting range a little bit. So I'm going to guess that the three betting range has maybe 54% equity. Or let's probably not even that much, like 53 and a half. Oh, all right. So almost no change in equity, just 52%. So let's check out how many trips each range has. So this range has three of a kind, 11%. Or, sorry, I just want the trips. That's 7.5%, whereas the small blind 3-bet has it. Oh, less than that. Okay, so the, the small, uh, the caller actually has more trips than the 3-better. That surprises me, but it is what it is. Let's see that. So that's ace-19, nine, 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 nine. So it's Okay, and then the... Okay, so that makes sense. I guess the, the cutoff, you know, was getting a good price with the, the suited 9s. So it called reasonably wide with them. It has all the suited 9s that are better than 9-8 suited. Whereas the 3-betting range has around a similar amount, but it doesn't have, wait, why is that? So there's, what am I doing wrong here? There's 18 combos of trips in the three betting range. And there's 18 combos of trips in the three bet call. Oh, because the cutoff three bet calling range is reasonably tight. There's, they both have the same trip hands, but the cutoff three bet calling range is actually tighter than the small blind three betting range. That wouldn't be the case in the other positions, right? When we're using a more polarized three betting range from the button or from the big blind against the cutoff open, then those ranges are overall tighter, right? We're only three betting 9% of the time in the big blind and 
10% of the time in the button, but since the small blind is not using a polarized three betting range, it's three betting wider. So if they both, if both the uh, small blind three betting range and the cutoff calling range have the same trip hands, because the small blind three betting range is wider, it has less trip combos or a, a smaller percentage of trips. Sorry. Hopefully that was clear. But in case it wasn't, I was saying both ranges have the same combos of trips, which is 10-9 suited and better. But since the small blind three betting range is actually like wider than the cutoff three bet calling range, because the small blind three betting range is not polarized, it's you know it, it, it can three bet aggressively because it has only good hands. Because of that, the small blind three betting range is wider and it has a lower percentage of its range B trips. Okay, so let's talk flop stuff. Here, I think the small blind is going to go ahead and C bet, you know, reasonably aggressively, but it's not going to get crazy with anything. One of the things that's difficult to do on a board like this is there aren't really that many obvious check calling hands. And what further makes this board tricky is it's kind of hard to check raise as the um, the three better because you don't really have like any hands that make really good check raises. Like the hands that might make good check raises are going to be like, you know, trips, but we block trips in our opponent's range if we have the trips. So if we check with like queen nine, on our opponent bets, he's likely bluffing, and then check raising is not going to be as effective as maybe check calling would be. So because of that, I don't think this is going to be a board that's kind of hard to play out of position, but I think I would play this board by C betting pretty aggressively, and then you could design some sort of flop check calling range. That would include like some random eights, like ace eight and eight seven, I think are going to be okay to check call. I think you could check call like a couple of over pairs, but they make, they're okay to bet too. And likewise, hands like Hands like Ace Queen are, I think, are going to be fine to check call as well. Um, Ace Queen has a good amount of equity even when it's behind, and I think Ace Queen is going to be the better hand reasonably often. So let's look here. Let's look at the cutoff flat versus three bet. So yeah, um, wow. So the cutoff only has a pair or better thirty-one percent of the time, and Ace Queen is going to beat or split with every non-pair hand. You know, on on the flop. Eight, sorry, on the flop, Ace Queen will be ahead of or be splitting with every non-pair hand. So yeah, checking ace-queen actually looks pretty good from uh, the small line three betting range right here. So that's something that I would do. Um, Ace-king's okay to check a call too. And to be honest, a lot of these hands probably have mixed strategies, but I I think that I'd be more likely to bet ace-king than I would be to bet ace-queen because with ace-king, I can justify my bet as like, hey, I'm going to bet with ace-king, but I might, you know, I can bet with ace-king and maybe check call it on the turn or, you know, reevaluate the turn and see if I want to keep betting or check fold. But if I bet ace-king on the flop, I can get value from the cutoffs ace-queens. Whereas with ace-queen, I can't really get value if I bet ace-queen. Maybe I can get a, some ace-jack to call, but probably not a whole lot. So if I was going to pick, you know, one hand to check call on the swap, my gut would be the best ones like ace-queen. Maybe ace-king is still a check too, but ace-king, I think you can also bet. You can maybe split it, bet some, check some. Okay, so yeah, so the out-of-position range here, I think you're going to want to just slow play some hands by check calling some of the good stuff. You're going to want to check call with some of the ace-queen stuff and some of the 8x stuff. You might still want to have some check raising range here, to be honest, but because of the like tricky removal effect, I think I would emphasize check calling the good hands a little bit more. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think that pretty much covers it. And as I said, I think I think the uh, small one can bet C bet here reasonably aggressively. Um, n- nothing crazy, but a lot more aggressively than in the last board. All right. When the cutoff's facing a bet, I think here you're gonna have. If I was in the cutoff, I would have a very, I, I would very rarely raise on this flop. I can't think of anything I'd really want to raise that badly, to be honest. You can maybe raise a couple, like ace nine and king nine and some bluffs, but that's about it. Again, mostly on a board like this, when the hands that are good enough to raise are trips and they're strong enough to slow play and they block the opponent's good hands, I'm more likely to just call on the flop. So the same way I didn't like really check raising as a small mind, I don't like really raising on this flop all that much. There still is probably some check raising range and some flop raising range, but I just don't think it should be that occur at that high of a frequency. Um, the weakest hand I want to check call with here, I should have done that first. It's probably going to be just some random gutter. I don't think I would call with anything that's not a gutter. Um, seven seemed really close to me. I feel like I would rather defend on this flop with like queen 10 than pocket sevens, but that doesn't mean they're not both calls. So I think sevens are going to be really close. I would defend any gutter or better. Let's see how many hands that is. So we have a weak pair of betters, 31.3%. Then we have 
gut shots and opening and straight draws is another 12%. And we're all, we're going to defend on this flop with like ace queen, as I already mentioned. Okay, I think I would defend sevens because I think I would rather defend sevens on the flop and fold like king jack and king queen. And so we'll fold king jack on the flop, king queen on the flop. What else? Ace 10 is going to get folded on the flop for sure. So that seems like it's enough folds. And pairs of sevens seem good enough that they actually are a flop call. And I might have just been way off thinking it can maybe be folded. Let's see how often the... So yeah, in, in general, I try to stay away from calling with hands where if we're beat, we're very unlikely to outdraw our opponent. And if we're behind, our opponent has a good amount of odds. That said, I still think you can defend sevens here now that I'm looking at the range more. Because sevens are only beat on the flop 33% of the time. And weird as it is... Oh, I guess less than that since sevens... No, let's just say 33%. And... Even the sevens can just sometimes bink the boat or hit a runner, runner straight, right? We do have three to a straight with the sevens. And I love three to a flush, three to a straight hands. So, you know, we're halfway there. We got three to a straight. So, yeah, I think sevens are a call. So I have sevens are a call, and then I would call with ace queen. I would call, just to be clear, I think most people probably already knew this, but when I say, like, I would fold, like, king, queen, ace, queen, ace, jack, I'm not talking about the three to the flush. So I would pretty much defend all of those. And then, yeah, defend the eights and that kind of stuff, too. So let's lock this flop and randomly generate the turn. All right, so the Jack of Diamonds. So remember on the last board texture, the Queen-10-8 board on the flop, how I said how if you call in the cutoff after the small line C-bets the flop, you're going to a lot of times have to be like, you know, just have a come-at-me-bro attitude, or if the turn card is like a blank, you're going to have a capped range, and you still have to call sometimes even though you're not happy. That's not really going to be the case here. Here, when we call it on the flop, we were pretty much slow playing all of our really strong hands. So I don't expect our range to be that much weaker than our opponents once we called. Because the thing that makes our opponent, sorry, the thing that makes our range weaker on the turn will be like if we don't have any really good hands because we raised them all. Here, we did not do that. So we're going to be in pretty good shape on this turn. So if we face a bet, it's going to be the same thing where you just call with your good stuff. Um, on the turn, I would probably start raising the nines. So... On the turn, I think you can slow play pocket jacks if you have them, pocket eights, nine eight suited, but I would start raising like the ace nine and the king nine on the turn at least, and probably the queen nine too, because those hands are more vulnerable and they're still really strong. Ten nine, I think you can still call, but that's because ten nine actually has the straight on the turn of the river. Sorry, the, the, the ten nine can make the straight on the river. And then with the ten nine, I also might just be value three betting, or sorry, value raising against myself, right? If I have 10-9 and my opponent has king nine, which will happen even though there's only one king nine suited to combo in the deck, I just lose more money by raising. So I think with 10-9, I would still call, but I would raise queen nine, king nine, ace nine, and then you can still keep still playing a good amount of stuff. So then on the river, you're actually, on the river, we're actually going to be doing fine, I think, after calling the turn two, because we can still still play the nine, eight, and the eights, and then the river will probably put some more good hands in our range. But yeah, on the turn, I would at least start raising the king nines, queen nines, ace nines. And you can also, you, you also should raise some bluffs. And you can raise like, you know, maybe on the turn, we'll raise like seven, six suited or something like that. Something that maybe can make our opponent fold some random tens. And then um, with seven, six suited, we of course have outs. So yeah, I would start raising some of those type hands. Um, it's also could be okay to raise something like queen king. Maybe queen king is not good enough to call, but we can use it as a raise since it has a gutter and the pair out might be good too. Um, the worst hand I would call with on the turn is probably pocket tens is the first thing that comes to my mind, but that might be too tight. But yeah, I think pocket tens is probably the worst thing I would call with. Oh, we could also raise the turn with queen 10. To completely missed that. Yeah, queen 10 I think I would raise the turn with as well. Okay, cool. So if we're in the small line and we bet the flop, I think we definitely want to pump the brakes with a lot of hands on the turn. So if we did bet like our aces or kings on the flop... I think it's time to start checking on the turn because I don't think we're going to be able to get three streets of value with a hand like Kings. I could be wrong, but I don't think we're going to be able to. And I think I would rather give my opponent an opportunity to bluff by checking. And I really don't want to face a raise. Like it just sucks so badly when you bet Kings and get raised on this turn. So I think I would start checking um, a lot of hands and my betting range on the turn would be pretty polarized. I'd probably still bet like Queens because Queens are a little bit more vulnerable. So everything can get to be pretty mixed. So I know that's not very helpful, but like on this turn, if I had to guess, we don't, we shouldn't in theory bet all of our aces, kings, and queens, but we also shouldn't bet none of them. It's probably a mixed strategy, and those are very hard to talk about or know what to do. If I had to pick one to bet with, I would probably bet with the queens because I think they're a little bit more vulnerable. Um, I mean, the 10, 
does give us the straight. So I would probably be a little more likely to bet with queens, I think, to try to make random kings or aces fold. Whereas kings, I guess, still have the same problem that a 10 and a queen are bad, whereas aces are a little bit less vulnerable. So, you know, maybe we should bet on the turn with our queens and kings and check the aces. I don't know exactly, but it's probably some mixed strategy with those hands. I would keep mostly betting the nines, but you can, again, check some, check, you can check raise some. And then I would probably just barrel all the queen tens because those hands are both really strong and, you know, there's a lot of river cards we don't want to see. So those I would definitely bet. Then I would obviously barrel the draws and king jack and ace jack. I don't know if we would have bet all of our ace jack or any of our ace jack on the flop, to be honest. If we did bet king jack, like maybe we bet some king jack suited, I probably would check call it on the turn. Um, but it's, it's again, it, it's pretty similar to like, well, I guess it's a little bit weaker than like our pocket queens because our opponent could have the three to the flush ace jack that called the flop. But yeah, like king jack, I would check it on the turn. But I don't think we would have see bet the flop with a lot of our ace jack off and king jack off. I think those would have mostly check folded. So they're probably not in our range on the turn. But um, queen jack, I would definitely check. And then jack 10, I would definitely check as well. So yeah, check jack 10, check queen jack, um, bet most of the nines, bet all the queen tens, um, and then probably bet more often than check the over pairs, but I think you can check those too. And then bet the draws. Okay, so let's finally do the river. All right, so the river's at two of spades. So it's kind of cool that we got, I, I know we only did two boards, but it's kind of cool we got two boards on somewhat opposite ends of the spectrum. Like, in the first board, when we bet and our opponent called, he was going to be in a lot of trouble on a blank Turner River, as we already talked about. But here, it's just much less of a problem because it's easier to slow play on this board. So if the cutoff bet flop and turn, and or sorry, if the small line bet flop and turn, and you get this two of spades on the river, he maybe can properly bet any two cards on the river because, you know, maybe his range is a little bit better once he bet the turn and then um, the cutoff called and then the river card comes a blank. But to be honest... I kind of doubt it. I, th I think the cutoff can probably defend reasonably aggressively. And if he can't defend enough to prevent the... Yeah, I, I don't think he would be able to... I don't think the cutoff would have a problem defending enough to prevent the small blind from being able to properly bet any two cards. Because I think the small blind would have been barreling on the turn pretty damn... Ag oh, again, with the D word. Wow. Pretty aggressively on a... Um, with a 10 or with a, a diamonds. And I don't think all those should be able to bluff on the river. So here, it's much easier to see the opponent having like air hands on the river than it was when the board was like queen, 10, 8, 7, 6 with three clubs. Here, it's just easier to see draws that would have bet on the turn and whiff. Okay, so because of that, um, I think the cutoff's going to defend pretty aggressively. And if the cutoff faces a bet, I don't think it's going to be that hard to know what to do. I think it's just going to be like, you're going to be like side calling with like some, maybe like queen, jack, so off the top of my head, I think I would call King I would call Ace Jack or better on the river, I think for sure. I think King Jack and Queen Jack seem kind of close. I don't really know. Again, if if you wanted to work out the math to see how often you need to call to prevent the opponent from being able to properly bet any two cards, I think that'd be a reasonable thing to do here, because the opponent should just have so much air in his range on the river. And I don't think the um either player's range is going to be that different in terms of strength. But not doing that this video, and that takes me a while. So, yeah, my guess is just I would call on the river with, like, King Jack or Ace Jack and better. And then on the river, I would muck, like, a lot of my turn draws that floated. Or not floated, but, you know, called the turn and then whiffed. Yeah, so I think the river should be pretty easy to play. And then bluff jamming's tricky, because on the river, we're going to be bluffing, or we're going to be value jamming with, like, pocket eights and nine eights. Um, but it's hard to figure out exactly like what hands make the best bluffs because the hands that make the best bluffs have like a good removal effect. And I'm not sure exactly what that would be here. It's hard to see one hand that has a much better removal effect than the other. I would say don't block a Jack. If we think our opponent can be value betting ace Jack, which I think is kind of reasonable. So I probably wouldn't want to have a Jack, but for the most part, yeah, we, we would value jam our nine, eight and eights and we would need a couple bluffs, but I don't think there's any hands that work that much better than other hands. Um, oh yeah, don't bluff the flush draw. So that's another thing you can really take from this video is, you know, if we have like ace, queen of diamonds, it might be the worst hand. Let's just make it ace, ten of diamonds. Ace, ten of diamonds might be like one of the weakest hands we can have in our range on the river if we're in the cutoff. So that might make you think, oh, if it's our weakest hand, like let's turn it into a bluff jam, but we're blocking two flush draws. So then our opponent can't be bet folding as many flush draws if we have um, the flush draw. So if we were going to bluff jam this river, I would not do it with a hand like ace, 10 of diamonds, where we're blocking both a 10 and two diamonds. I would think you'd be more likely to do it with a hand that, um, 
Well, it might be kind of tricky if you don't bluff a jack or with the ace or with the diamonds, but you would need to find something. So yeah, uh, the ace ten of diamonds I think would be like the nut worst hand to bluff with. But you know, we might have like a we might have like ace ten of hearts. That might be okay to bluff with something like that, and we won't need we'll need very very few bluffs um, to balance out our few value jams here. Okay, so I think that wraps up this video. I'm actually really curious to get feedback on this video because it was a lot of talking and randomly generating stuff and talking about like the concepts that I think are the most important without me having to write everything down. But I think a video like this is going to give you much sen uh, much better sense of how to like reasonably approach a board like when you're realistically playing. Whereas, yeah, you might get better advice and it might be a little bit more precise if I write out every single combo. But the problem with that is you can easily find like a good strategy that's not that implementable. Whereas I've spent tons and tons and tons of time doing that kind of stuff. And you can still sort of see what my skill level is for how well I could like actually implement that knowledge while playing. Because almost everything I did, I was just generating, like randomly generating while I was recording. So if I can make the decision while recording, I probably can make the decision while playing. Whereas if I have to sit down and write out all the combos, then yeah, I'm not going to be able to probably take the correct line while I'm actually playing. So give me your feedback for videos like this. They're fun to do, but I want to see how much you guys like them. So thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you learned some stuff. Uh, good luck at the tables. Bye.